Um, you know, just I and and I just want to I want to say this. Uh, I'm a I'm a really big uh, supporter of faculty taking sabbatical leave. Um, I've had the opportunity to be able to grant that at uh, previous institutions uh, where I've been at. I think it enriches the college. Um, it, it certainly is is enriching for the faculty member who's doing it, um, but it, it's uh, it's uh, it's beneficial and enriching for uh, their fellow faculty members, for the college, for the students. Uh, anytime uh, professional development like that can be done, it's wonderful. And and Fulbright uh, is is a fantastic program. And so if anybody wants to take advantage of that, I'm I'm thrilled that FIPS going to be there talking to you about it and that you guys you're going to have somebody from Fulbright talking about it because it really is a a great opportunity and and um it's 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 like traveling abroad right I mean at you know at, it, nobody has ever gone to another country and came back and said you know god I just I miss McDonald's so much uh actually if you if you uh, do travel abroad you, chances are you're not going to miss McDonald's at all you're going to find it anywhere but anyway uh but all of that to say, uh, I, I'm, I'm a big supporter of sabbatical. Um, we will, uh, you don't have to just, if, if you miss anything that I'm saying today, um, that's okay. It's in the faculty contract. And it's actually laid out very well, starting on page 15 of the current, uh, the current contract where it talks about sabbatical leave. There are some things in there that it limits. Uh, for instance, it limits, it, so it limits, um, uh, sabbatical to uh, one full semester. Uh, so that would be a fall semester or a spring semester that I probably would want to stick with. There are some other limitations on there. It says that we will never do more than two uh, sabbaticals uh, at one time. I, I, I'm guessing uh, that I could use some management discretion on that. And, and allow more than that if I needed to, and I would be willing to consider that. It also says that we will not allow any more than one person from one division at a time. Uh, I even mentioned this to uh, Carol Lee uh, the other day about it because I said, yeah, do you really care if you've got somebody from English and somebody, I mean, her division, arts and sciences, what that would mean is if somebody uh, was an English person and was going to do a sabbatical, we couldn't allow somebody who's history or physics uh, to do it as well. Well, that those don't cross over. I I don't I, I I understand why they put that in there, and it's probably to protect the college from having too many people gone from a particular division or whatever. But my percep my uh, perspective on that is I honestly I'm I'm not sure I would care. Um, uh, like I said, I don't know that I would care about having any more than two. Some of that has to do with with money though, um, and maybe that's also protecting. Uh, the college in that, because what we're doing is there, there's a couple of thoughts in there. When you take a sabbatical, you get 50% of your, so for the semester that you are gone, you get 50% of your salary and you retain all of your benefits. Um, so you're not getting fit. We are saving 50% of the salary, but some of that I'm guessing is also that we are then supplementing the, the idea of covering your classes. And we do get to, and ultimately I, Ultimately, uh, myself and Dr. Illich would be the ones who would be approving any any sabbatical. Um, but uh, I can tell you that I'm going to be paying very close attention to my associate dean and uh, in the respective divisions and dean of that division. Uh, if they say, no, it's OK, so and so can be gone because we can cover their classes with overload, adjuncts, whatever it is. Um, and so. Uh, so we have to we have to obviously take a look at that as far as qualifications for sabbatical um, uh, from what the contract says, it says five consecutive years. Uh, so if if uh, somebody has been with the college five years or more uh, consecutively, then um, then they are qualified. They qualify uh, to uh, apply for a sabbatical uh, and they are, are also then uh, committing themselves to staying with us. Uh, for an additional two years after uh, after they leave, I mean after they come back from from sabbatical. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. Does that pretty well cover it? that? That was the that that was quick and dirty. That was a seven minute uh, deal there, Nicole. What do you what do you think? Great. I think uh, one question we had was whether or not it pertains to staff. Um. 
question. I don't believe we have a policy for that. Okay. <laughs> so it's not a no, they said. <laughs> Can I, tell, I was wondering about that, Dr. McGillis, because um, some community colleges have that opportunity available for um, professional staff and administrators. And I was wondering if that's something that we could look into, especially for global enrichment. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say no. Because I'm not because I be because and the reason is, is because if we do think that it's something that that our staff or our, our uh, or administrators would would be enriched by and then come back and further enrich the college by doing, um, I think we would probably be OK with that. I We just need to look at it. I you know, but I'm going typically you think a sabbatical that's that's typically a faculty thing. But but no, it's not a no. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your time this morning. I know you have somewhere okay. else to be. Thank so you. Really Pop appreciate it. But um, and and if anybody has any questions, shoot me an email or 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 get it to you and you get it to me. Uh, uh, any anything like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I got. It. Okay, folks. One second. I'm gonna um, get us up a screen for FIP here. Um, I hope you sent it to me. Right there. Oh, there we go. No, I think there's going to be. Let's do that one. And uh, maybe one more down. There's right below. Might as well grab them both. Thank you. Will they come up? We know. I think the other one came up. Hold on. <laughs> So we'll still need, which one do you want? Uh, let's do journey, yeah. Okay, so then uh, share screen. This one? Yeah. Let me just start it as a slideshow. We don't have to. Yeah. Maybe not. Uh, is that all right? Sure. Okay. Uh, folks, we're going to switch over to the brass, and he's going to talk about his experiences as a Fulbright participant. Hi, everybody. Hi, Beyond Hi. and here. I love this. I have my face to you, my back to most folks here. So I'm. Yeah. <laughs> I have a laptop. Thank you. So I'm, I'm using a, a PowerPoint as a, as a crutch, my security blanket. So yes, uh, in 2007, um, so I would have applied in about 2006 and uh, quite a lengthy process. I think that Fulbright person, I was trying to brush up on some of the logistics. They award about 400 um, Fulbright Scholar uh, Awards a year, according to their website, 10% are accepted. I was informed um, that uh, I was cleared for funding, but they were assessing their funding needs. So it was kind of a, a fake out when I was notified, part uh, yay and what. Uh, so they didn't want to see my application as a failure. Don't see as I was sobbing. Um, it got approved for funding, but the funding wasn't there yet. They they hadn't gotten that, you know, I think uh, the U.S. federal government, of course, uh, funding can be a very complicated process, as we know these days. Um, so there's a, um, a hold up there that some, some projects got, uh, actually did get funding, and some uh, were approved for funding, which means I guess they liked the idea, but they did have a priority. Um, so I was not originally funded, and then it was funded. So that was uh, that was uh, very exciting. Um, my study abroad experiences, uh, you know, my traveling abroad experience have been very limited at that time in my life. I hadn't been. Um, you don't consider the C Caribbean vacation really a cultural, somewhat of it can be, but um, you know, I've, I've been on vacation. Um, and I went to Canada for a day. So I was hungry um, from 
I was hungry for a, a cultural experience and I was observing, uh, you know, uh, so many of our students, of course, are from different cultures and experience a language and cultural experience that I was in a privileged position there. And I, I thought I would benefit as a greatly as a faculty member to be in that kind of a situation where I am in a minority speaker of the dominant language and culture. Um, so, and I thought I would like to see, uh, I would like to experience that uh, cultural minority kind of an experience and um, of course teach. And I had a, I, I would have, I wanted to study Spanish. Um, so that started uh, what I currently still study Spanish every day a little bit with some of my colleagues here. And um, so I went, but I needed a, a school that A, was not, uh, I did not have to be fluent in the local language. And um, yes, uh, and I needed a contact there, a cooperating instructor. So I, I did not have that network. So that was my first big hurdle is finding a school, and I really had no international connections to post-secondary educational institutions for the most part. Um, so I was starting from scratch there, definitely not in Spanish-speaking countries. Um, so I was just, and I had a preference for um, yeah, to stay in the West, I guess. I, I, I was drawn to um, South America and Central America as opposed to, I did look at Spain. But anyway, I started Googling schools and looking to see if they had a bilingual website. Um, I don't want to get, I guess, too in the weeds. But so I was just starting to reach out and email uh, English programs where I could be a guest uh, instructor, professor, and uh, contribute to and learn from their program and experience uh, that abroad cultural experience. Um, so I ended up uh, getting Alonzo um, responding in uh, Costa Rica was really one of the few that did respond. Um, and he was wonderful and had studied in the U S and, um, and taught, uh, English at a university in Costa Rica and was very open to getting some support, um, especially for their advanced English speakers. So they had uh, a need for me. They, they, they wanted me to teach in English to their advanced students. And so that was a first big piece of, of the Fulbright experience for me is establishing that connection with Alonzo. Uh, God bless him, rest his soul. He has passed away way too early. He's younger than me anyway. Uh, so Alonzo was my collaborator. So we designed a with his input, that talked a lot about how I could be useful and designed what courses I would be teaching. And so that was uh, that was gold right there, finding a friend uh, and collaborator at the host institution. So my application could be was off uh, was on its way in terms of the application process. We at that time did not have anything, I believe, in our contract. Maybe some administrators. I definitely I think was the first, maybe the only one to get this kind of a a Fulbright. So it was new ground. So uh, with the VP at the time, Dennis Hedrick and um, our, my chair, uh, Carolee Ritter, uh, fortunately worked something out. So I did continue to teach online for SCC, finishing up a quarter. We're on the quarter system. And then I did teach online a couple of classes uh, while I was teaching in Costa Rica. So I was not on full leave. Um, so I had to still kind of pull my, pull my weight a little bit on the, on the home front. Um, that's my relic recollection of it pretty much. So I was, uh, the Fulbright scholarship was pretty amazing. Um, in terms of, you know, they cut you a check. It's a pretty flat fee. Uh, they fund your whole family. If you have dependents to study, to travel with you, how's uh, transportation, that's all factored in. So at that time in 07, I got a $30,000 check from Fulbright into my bank account. Um, and uh, we were feeling pretty good about being able to experience and live in country um, in Costa Rica. So we had, uh, I think uh, all three of our kids were middle school students. So they attended middle school in Costa Rica 
while we were there, um, which is a memorable time for them. I was just gonna show you where, uh, this is a school, it's called Earth University, and we had the provost speak as part of our Lunch and Learn series at Earth. So I have still have friends there. Um, and um, it's uh, built, it's, an, it's a one, I, I think it'd be great to have a, a SEC visit, um, a student uh, study abroad, uh, especially for ag students. This is an ag school. It's one degree there. So it's a horticulture degree. And those students are pulled from across the globe from tropical regions. So they teach sustainable ag in the tropics. And so they're doing, uh, those students are up at five. They do research until um, 7.30, have breakfast, and then they're in class all day. And they are out in the fields, uh, in labs, doing research. And this is an undergrad degree. Um, those are the English colleagues with Alonzo there, uh, Sharon, Alonzo, Christine, uh, another Sharon, and myself. Um, yes, uh, so you could see the, the school in the background. This is US funded dollars to build this school in the jungle on the, toward the Caribbean side of Costa Rica. Um, so uh, I needed help, right? I'm not uh, really a seasoned traveler, but Sharon picked me up. I, I, I landed in country. I spent a couple of weeks uh, living with a host family. I set this up and of course Fulbright funded it. So I spent two weeks in San Jose in a Spanish uh, intensive Spanish school, which is what uh, students who come to this school from Africa, uh, South America, I mean, if they're not speaking Spanish, they get, uh, I think they get a month and then they're in these undergrad classes full time in Spanish. All classes are taught in Spanish, all those students come from around the world. So it was quite a cultural experience. Most students are native spe Spanish speakers. I mean, I would say 50, 50 to 60 percent. Um, but it was a, quite a, um, an interesting cultural milieu, if I may. Um, so uh, from Belize and yeah, so I, I I, I have former students from back then, these original students that uh, I taught a, you know, what a class that was called New Media. So they were writing essays and making those into media projects, which I thought would be um, a valuable way for them to work really intensely on uh, what would be an important story told in a language that is not their first language. So to try the, the, the task, is to see if students can get, generate something very meaningful to them in a foreign language. Um, so that was a, and so to do those media projects, they have to rehearse, rehearse, rewrite those scripts a lot and take a lot of care in the images that they, they select. I got a little off track there. Um, let me just catch my breath for a second. Is there any? Okay. Yeah, so I, I think I was only there for uh, six months. Uh, so I wish I could have been there longer, but I did have a relationship with that institution and went have been back two more times to teach as a guest. Um, I taught an online uh, taught online with a group of students doing a similar kind of a project, and then we went uh, when we when SCC was on break, I went to Costa Rica and finished the course in person with students there. And I went back a second time, a third time with a colleague uh, from the U.S. to to do another one of those classes. So I've had uh, pretty amazing experiences working with those students at this very what what I would consider a pretty remarkably unique um, institution, an international institution, very forward thinking in the way that they uh, teach and have students engaged in research. And it would be amazing um, to have more folks experience what that's like. But I know there's institutions all over the world that are pretty amazing. Um, this is a picture that the last time I was there. Um, and uh, Joel here is a, a student in 07, was not in my class. We met walking around campus, quite a charismatic young guy. And uh, he went on to get uh, a 
Many of those students at Earth graduate and they move, they have internships in the U.S., they have internships with ag schools, I mean, some large industrial kinds of ag locations. They have uh, interns at UNL's ag program. So I've met, I've been able to meet, uh, re-acquaint myself with students who are living in Lincoln from Earth. And Joel uh, ended up with a PhD from first uh, master's at Florida, then um, University of Missouri. And he's a professor at Texas A&M. I believe, and a researcher with a young family. And uh, I still talk to him um, and have some, some contact. So I take a, um, another little, uh, I, I guess I could speak. Uh, so, you know, I, I've done media work, digital storytelling. And I, after that, I was uh, inspired to use some of those essays, those me digital essays in my, my teaching with uh, classes here. And we did some similar kinds of uh, media projects um, post uh, first Fulbright experience. And um, yes, as, so that's fun to introduce uh, students here to some of those cultural, I would call them cultural artifacts, even though they're very individualized and personal, they are reflective of some unique indigenous cultures um, in Latin America and South America and even some African countries. Yes. Um, so I have a, a pretty amazing experiences with uh, that, that began with the Fulbright. And I guess I will, you know, um, yeah. Uh, other, other, other things. One, uh, you know, I was, uh, one of my travels since I was there a couple of months without my family before my family came living apart from my family. So I got married pretty young these days, probably 22 or 23. And we had children pretty fast. And then up until this point, of course, I not traveled much without my family. So being a part of them, I, um, I did have uh, my one and only I did have a panic attack. And I'm associating that with being away from my family. It just I don't know what I was thinking. I was sleeping uh, at the foot of a volcano uh, in, in, indoors at the foot of a volcano that you could hear kind of glowing in the sky and the darkness in a jungle. If you've ever been in a jungle <laughs> uh, a long ways from any cities that, that it's, it's a different kind of uh, experience. And I had a, I had a pretty hard uh, night that night uh, breathing for uh, whatever that was a volcano and other kinds of things that I don't have a, thing, a pulse on, but there was some something happening there uh, I would associate with traveling abroad. Um, I was not afraid. I was with a colleague uh, from Earth traveling and um, it got me good, but I survived obviously. Um, uh, without a without a paper sack. So that's, I, I don't know if that's, <laughs> Otherwise, you know, uh, wherever you're at, uh, you know, you take all the precautions when we're in San Jose, uh, you know, that country was pretty, pretty safe, pretty uh, developed in terms of its educational system and its uh, um, the, the standard of living there um, is uh, certainly there's severe po poverty, but uh, it's a pretty um, safe, uh, welcoming country. Um, yes, and not very, although uh, there is a Burger King. I did hit a Burger King uh, up the road. It was pretty uh, pretty non-Westernized, uh, although it may be much different now. I know it's a pretty much of a hot spot for, for tourism and some retirees from up north of there. Um, what did you teach? Mm -hmm. What did you teach? I taught a what it, we called a new media class, uh, which would be an advanced English class. Um, yep, I taught one class there. Yep. Um, and did the so, Fulbright cover the salary for that, or did they pay you for that? Or that's a good question. No, they did not. Uh, Earth University did not pay me for that. Yeah, so I was uh, still collecting my at that time a full. I was still fully paid by SEC. So. Yeah. But that wouldn't be the case now. Like Dr. McGill mentioned, it's fifty percent. But you got yeah. a check from Fulbright. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, and our 
full right person should be on any Smith. So yes. Can, you know, I was, uh, you know, I had to live on campus. So whatever they wanted to charge me on campus, and they knew Westerners visit there. Uh, a lot of researchers studying uh, ag. So they, those very nice living accommodations. Um, but, uh, you know, they 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 took a, a pretty good chunk. I got ripped off a rental car nightmare. Um, well, nightmare. Uh, it was a bad car. OK, um, but. Yes, uh, I, all right. So if anybody, I, <laughs> many folks, a handful of folks followed a blog I kept. I was really uh, pretty steady in processing emotionally about my home stay there, uh, some poetry, some maps, uh, some YouTube videos, if anybody wants to chuckle at how uh, kind of crazy excited and at times scared. Um, there's a lizard on my back, you know, some, there's some fun, uh, some for me, some important uh, documenting of that trip, me riding on the banana tram or it was going by. Um, anyway, um, thanks for listening and allowing me to, to revisit that experience. I hope folks will consider it in the future. After she talks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Morgan, will I see if she's here? Anybody on Zoom have questions for Chris? application onerous? No, no. There was, I was just revisiting what they have online there and it, it seems very manageable if, you know, if you're comfortable writing, because um, yes, pretty, pretty, yeah. I mean, I had to design, I, I, from my recollection, I had to Excuse me, imagine what my class, based on my conversations with Alonzo, what my class content, my syllabus, units of study, I had to prepare some of that and do as much imagining about how I would benefit from this in my teaching and personally as I could in terms of ex being explicit about my purposes. Not yet, no. Oh, um, so, um, how... The postal, right? How did it change? Well, um, hard to put, uh, you know, this is fairly, you know, can, can I say, um, so I went in saying, I want that kind of experience to be in the minority culture where you get lost. <laughs> and, and I think I did. And if, if that panic kind of panic attack experience was any, maybe an indication, a symptom of being in that role and what that's like, uh, it's kind of a potential illustration of evidence that I was there and, and it was oftentimes uncomfortable. And you could see in any of those clips where I'm in cultural experience and I'm not a super, uh, you know, if you're not very extroverted, you know, and you're socially savvy, you really feel a heightened sense of being outside that circle um, and engaging other people who most of the people in those situations that I was, some of those situations, many of those situations I was in uh, were not English speakers. I mean, English is not anywhere if you're off the tourist path, English don't, you cannot count on it at all. So I was struggling with being forced to try to speak, which is what my students are being forced to do, to use English when it's usually not their go-to language for many of our students and what that is like when I'm calling, uh, you know, a medical service on campus because my wife is ill and I just want to ask for a you know, a certain medication. And instead I'm getting an ambulance pulling up to our house. I'm like, oh my God, uh, get your, get your. <clears throat> so somebody who you know, teaches English, you know, and being articulate and being the one who was really fumbling constantly and feeling that uh, vulnerability with your audience is uh, I think very humbling. So a, a raised level of empathy and patience and understanding what goes on across that cultural uh, divide, uh, cultural barrier, crossroads um, is lasting. I'm sorry, Neil, I'm going to pause you just for a second. Our, our Fulbright person has gotten on and we've only got 10 minutes with her. Okay. So I'm going to, we'll come back to you.
Hi, Miss Ruffin, are you there? You're, you're Hi, yeah, you? I'm, I'm here. Um, you have more than 10 minutes, though. I can stay until the end oh, of the hour. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood that email. Perfect. Okay, yeah, no um, worries. So we've had a discussion about sabbatical and a really lovely discussion from one of our um, Fulbright recipients. But I think if you could do just a few minutes of overview, that would be really lovely for everyone. And um, you should be able to share your screen if you need sure. to. Sure. So thank you for joining us. Of course. Give me one second to get set up here. If, if somebody else had something, I think I interrupted something. If somebody else has something to say, they can go ahead while I get this set up. Well, I was just going to ask a fairly innocuous question about, uh, you know, after the experience, having kind of got special ties with people that you met on the trip, and so then we came back into that realm. Yeah, well, we had, uh, for Lunch and Learn last uh, spring, we had the provost of Earth University uh, speak about their, their school, and uh, I got to kind of interview her about their student cultural experience uh, there at Earth University. So I had that relationship still. Um, I do have a, a professor there that I can. Uh, I, I have sustained several relationships with former students there also. Uh, professors, you know, I'm, I'm still friends with several, like on Facebook or whatnot. Yeah, not, not pretty decent. Okay, could be better. Okay. Yes. Mostly in a casual way. Sounds yeah, like. yeah, exactly. Okay, so is everyone able to see my screen? Yeah. Zoom, are you able to see it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I can go ahead and get started. This is going to be an abridged version of the presentation. But essentially, um, for our overview, we can just go ahead and talk about what the um, actual Fulbright US Scholar program is. Um, as I'm sure as many of you know, it is a partnership with um, 160 countries worldwide. This does fluctuate year to year, but it, uh, for the most part, um, that is around where we're at. Um, for the scholar program, we're focusing on professionals, lawyers, journalists, artists, um, administrators, faculty, and all of the above. So a lot of people, there can be a confusion of this conflating scholars with students, but um, I'm sure you've all gone over the fact that this is very much open to, um, to uh, fa faculty and staff at universities across the country and colleges. Um, the mission to foster mutual understanding between nations, advance knowledge uh, across communities and improve lives around the world. I'm sure that I'm one that you're all familiar with. Um, and we are sponsored by the US Department of State. So we do have a really large focus on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Uh, and this in particular, it might be of interest to you because we are placing a very large focus on increasing the number of community college staff and faculty um, participating in the program. Um, we would love to get feedback on the barriers that community college staff and faculty are facing in particular. Um, but we are here to help you in any way that we can and to show you that there are many community college faculty and staff who have done this before you and are able to help you and guide you along the way. I know you have an alumni of your own who's speaking today. Um, we also have quite a few alumni ambassadors and other alumni who are able to speak to this topic. Uh, so by the numbers, we have over 8,000 awards annually, uh, about 900 U.S. scholars and administrators, uh, 900 visiting scholars. So those are scholars coming in from other countries uh, to U.S. institutions. Um, quite a few students as well, foreign students and the language teaching assistants. Uh, so as I'm sure you've heard in uh, your alumni presentation before, Fulbright is very transformational. We foster relationships, we foster collaborations across um, institutions and other community building uh, institutions aside from educational institutions. Um, it's a way for you to expand your publishing network, your, your professional network, um, a way for you to bring other cultures into your classroom and other teaching methods into your classroom as well. 
uh, Fulbright scholars are incredibly important as serving as ambassadors for international exchange. So when you go abroad, you're, you're serving as an ambassador of the United States um, and United States higher education. And that's something that we take very seriously. Um, you're gaining the professional recognition and you are joining a very vibrant alumni network. Fulbright is family friendly. I missed the beginning of your uh, alumni presentation. I apologize, but it sounds like you did bring your wife abroad with you. So we are able to bring dependents, um, bring spouses, bring children, and uh, many, many, many of our awardees do bring their children and their spouses. Um, and it is very supportive. So there are benefits that allow you to, um, to help you to bring your family with you. Um, most applicants do engage with our staff. Our staff are incredibly supportive. They are available via phone, via email, um, via webinars, via office hours to uh, help you to, to um, complete your application, to help you find the right award for you, to help you understand better how um, you can choose an award that will work best with your with your lifestyle, with your um, with your own personal workload, with your own institution. And you do have continued support the entire time you are in country um, and when, on your return home as well. And like we said before, of course, you have access to thousands of alumni um, who you can actually find. And I'll show you in a little bit how you can find other alumni on your campus or potentially on other campuses that you might have connections with. So some basics, the eligibility, you do have to be a US citizen to apply, um, otherwise that if dual citizenship and other things will vary depending on country and award, um, but you do have to be a US citizen. You can be a naturalized citizen or you can be awarded citizenship later as long as you have citizenship at the time of your application. Um, this also, the degree uh, experience depends also on award. It's our favorite phrase over here at Fulbright is it depends. Um, things do vary drastically from award and by country. Um, most of our awards, I will say, do not most, a lot of our awards, awards do require a PhD or some sort of terminal degree, but there are plenty that are uh, available to master's degrees, uh, whatever the terminal degree is in your field. If you're applying as a professional, you don't even need to have that degree. You are just need to have that experience um, that backs up your status as a professional. Um, you might need teaching experience if you're applying to a teaching award, but there are other types of awards that do not require teaching experience. You might have um, research experience or um, professional experience, again, depending on what kind of project you're proposing. Um, and if you have had a previous scholar award, we do ask that you wait two years, well, not ask, we require that you wait two years from the end of your last Fulbright before applying for another one. Uh, so there are four, really four different types of awards. There's some subcategories within that. So the scholar awards are the awards that um, are focused on the um, faculty and staff. Some of these are, like I said, teaching or research. Uh, these are sort of like the main group of awards. There are postdoctoral awards, which are, as the name would suggest, they are available to postdocs and um, to early career mm -hmm. um, folks who are just kind of getting their start in their field. Um, Distinguished Scholar Awards are focused more on people who have been in their field for quite some time, have, have really had a lot of accomplishments in their field. Um, and are really towards the uh, reaching towards like the end of their career. Um, and finally, International Education Administrator Awards. Um, these are, I think almost always two week seminars offered in a handful of countries where it's more of a, you go over with a cohort and um, they will, and you visit another institution, another educational institution and sort of swap ideas, talk about how, how things are run differently in different institutions and how cultural, um, differences, political differences might affect that as well. Um, and then we also, with our, our awards, we offer flex options. These are very popular with our community college grantees because as the name would suggest, they are flexible. So these are available in about 63 countries, all world regions. Um, and this will change. So I'll make sure when you check your award to check uh, what the requirements are. But these allow multiple visits over a two year period. So it's whatever agreement you come to with the country with whatever's offered, but you might say you have a two year period, maybe you 
go to your host country for a month and then return for a few months and then go back to the host country for a month or so. And this allows you to sort of balance your, your home life and your life on your Fulbright um, and not commit to maybe going abroad for a full year if that's not something you're able to commit to. Um, we also offer a Fulbright Public Policy Fellowship if you're a professional working in public policy. And um, there are some global and regional awards. I will say these are our most competitive awards, but these allow you to complete a project in more than one country on the same award. So selecting the right award, um, we're gonna focus on you know, matching your interest, your country interest, your expertise, career pro profile. Most of our awards do not require language ability, but some of them do. So be sure to read those requirements carefully. Um, project relevance and all of this will be really thoroughly explained on our website. So you'll see this is what our webpage looks like. And on the left hand side here, you'll see the award details, so just the overview of award requirements, benefits, um, and country and area overview. And then this is actually very helpful on the left here, you'll see the name of the staff member who is in charge of the uh, outreach for that award and recruitment for that award. So you'll have their name, phone number and email address, um, and you will be able to ask them any questions that you might have, connect and get uh, help from them in your application process. Uh, the application components are fairly simple. It is the application form itself, which is online on our website, the project statement, um, your CV, two letters of recommendation, a uh, language proficiency report if required. Like I said, most do not require this, but be sure to check the requirements um, and a letter of invitation again, if required. Um, occasionally you will need outlines for a syllabi if you are doing a teaching award, a reference list if you're doing a research work and portfolio submissions if you are an artist, architect, journalist, anything that falls under that category. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit just because I know we're short for time. So the application cycle begins in February. So right now we are in the off cycle. The application cycle for this past year just closed in September, um, but it does open again in February. And then that deadline will be again in um, next September 15th. Um, right now we are in the review period. So we are currently in the US review period, peer review, where we are um, reviewing applications with other people in those fields. And uh, you're usually notified of your application status sometime between November and January of the following year, basically, uh, or sorry, the status, which will be if you have been moved forward to the, the next and your final decision, you'll be notified the following year between January and June. Um, there are also many options to bring foreign Fulbrighters to your campus. This is a really great way to introduce Fulbright to your, your campus, your institution. So first we have the Scholar in Residence program where you can apply to host a scholar from um, another country to teach for a semester or a year. You can also submit joint applications um, with nearby institutions as well, and those can be very successful. Um, you have the OLF fund, which is very um this is a great way to dip your toe in the water, we say. The Outreach Lecturing Fund, you, we have a list online of all of the Fulbright visiting scholars that are currently in the United States, and we fund them for short-term lectures, um, usually two to six days, about a week, to basically whatever you need them to speak about. It could be about their particular discipline, it could be about a cultural topic, or just to bring more um, of an international presence to the campus. Um, and then finally, for uh, those in language um, departments, you can bring in Fulbright language teaching assistants, sorry about that, um, Fulbright language teaching assistants to have a native speaker hum and en enhance your classroom and help students to understand the language, better pronunciation, cultures, things like that. Um, there are some additional US programs. I'm not sure, I didn't look ahead of time. Does um, the Southeast have the, um, any four-year degrees no. or is it just the two-year? Okay, yep, so for the student program, it, it is a requirement that students um, are in a four-year program. So this would mostly be focusing, like I said, again, on the scholars side of things. So I will email you the slides following this so that you can you can give that out and you guys can all click on the links and explore the website and, and get connected. But um, let's see, we have about 15 minutes left. I can answer questions or I, whatever else you had left for the rest of the program. 
I just mentioned that students have to be in a four-year program. Many of our students are transfer students, so although they're not in a four-year program while they're with us, they are as part of their four-year program. Has Fulbright given any consideration to expanding that definition to uh, open up these opportunities to more diverse students? Yeah, so I, I can't speak to that. Um... Fully, I do, you know, students, once they've transferred into another four year program, they can apply for the student program. Unfortunately, it does go towards that institution that they're applying under. Um, I know that there is a lot of conversation happening right now about how we can make that more inclusive for um, community college students, but I, I don't, there's no, there's no real answer to that just yet. Well, thank you, Rose. I appreciate your time today. Any Anyone on Zoom have any questions? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, and questions? like I said, I will give you the slides and there are um, these emails here, scholars at IIE.org. You can direct all of your questions there and there is always somebody ready to help and ready to answer. Thank you, we appreciate it. You have other questions for FIP? I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Rose, we do have a question. Rose, oh, so. never mind, sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> in, uh, in terms of sabbatical um, and taking a 50% pay cut, I think if anybody knows the contract, say, you, you know, if you, if you were to say, okay, I want to go somewhere, do something, or you know, I don't collect a secondary income to help fill your gaps as part of your sabbatical experience. I don't think it was possible at one time. So you were, uh, I don't think that was allowed to, to collect uh, an income to replace your lost income as even part of your sabbatical experience. I'm not sure that was my interpretation at the time, uh, but I, I just wonder, I just think, that is an, a question that anybody's thinking about Savannah Vocal, I think could, that, that question may come up <laughs> in your, as you would make a plan that, uh, yeah, I could go teach somewhere uh, part-time maybe if I build a relationship, it's non-Fulbright and collect some, you know, kind of adjunct rate and learn about a new institution somewhere else. But I'm not sure you can, our SEC allows that. Mm -hmm. Don't think Dennis at that time allowed that. And I'm not sure what the contract says, but I, I thought that was a, a problem um, that I hope is uh, more open to make those experiences possible. Well, I know that a reduced, a reduced salary for sabbatical is pretty standard across most institutions. So. Oh, that's all I know. <laughs> that, that's, that's not on. No. Okay. Else? Thank you, everyone. Everyone on Zoom as well. Thank you for being here. Please reach out. Um, I have. I'll share this uh web or this PowerPoint once I get it, and I have some other um, contacts and things. So, I think I know everyone here. So. Say hello. Well, thank you, everyone, and I hope you can join us at 1.30 for our session with the Mini Moccasins group.